It is Wednesday, December 14th, and we are here tonight at the Four Lakes Church of Christ in Madison, Wisconsin to study the book of Genesis. So we are back to Genesis, and we are in Genesis chapter 28 tonight. So you may want to be turning there. We'll be there in just a few moments. So Genesis chapter 28 is where we'll be. We're very glad that you joined us in class tonight, and we also want to invite you to join us this coming Lord's Day morning at 930 for a time of Bible study. We're just a few lessons into our brand new study of the book of Ephesians, and Aaron has been doing a great job with that. I've enjoyed being in that class, and I'm learning something, and it's good for us. So uh, good to study Paul's letters, and we're doing that this Sunday at 9.30, and this would be a great time to jump in. And then at uh, 10.30, we'll have our worship assembly. We're continuing in that uh, series of lessons that we just started this past Wednesday concerning uh, the concept of restoring simple New Testament Christianity. And we want to invite you, if you're visiting with us tonight, if you have any questions or comments or input on the class to give me a call or send a text to 608-224-0274 or send an email to fourlakeschurch at gmail.com and we would absolutely love to hear from you. Tonight we're back to the book of Genesis, so the book of beginnings written primarily by Moses, and we're now starting to focus in on the life of Jacob. So Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. We looked at Isaac very briefly. Of course, we spent a couple months at least, maybe three months on Abraham, starting way back, I think, at the end of Genesis chapter 11, um, up until just a couple weeks ago. So a little bit on Isaac, and now we move on mainly to Jacob. So last week, we looked at Jacob's deception. You may remember earlier, Esau had sold his birthright to his younger brother, Jacob. Jacob was just a a short time old, uh, younger. They were twins, basically, as I remember it. So it's kind of strange to us, though, that you could actually sell the right to having been born first. But he did. He sold his birthright for a bowl of stew. So he was really, really hungry that day. And last week we noted that when it came time for Isaac to give the blessing to his firstborn, and remember, um, Isaac, the dad, loved Esau more. So a lot of favoritism in that family. But we learned last week that uh, the, the mom, Rebecca, loved Jacob more, told Jacob about this plan. And while Esau is out in the field killing something for his dad, Jacob beats him to it. And so he gets a goat from the field and Rebecca cooks the goat. And then she and Jacob work together to deceive Isaac into giving him the greater blessing, the blessing of the firstborn. So once this is discovered... Esau is absolutely um, heartbroken, um, but he's also mad. I mean, he's really mad, and he vows to make things right by killing his brother. And so Rebecca then tells Jacob that he needs to get out of there, and he needs to leave for a few days until Esau has had a chance to calm down a bit. So that brings us to Genesis chapter 28. And Genesis 28 is shorter than most, and so perhaps this might make up for this past Sunday sermon, which was a bit longer than most. So I think we'll be in class a little bit, uh, little bit shorter time than normal. But our first paragraph tonight is Genesis chapter 28, verses 1 through 5. Genesis chapter 28, verses 1 through 5. So Isaac called Jacob and blessed him and charged him and said to him, You shall not take a wife from the daughters of Canaan. Arise, go to Padan Aram, to the house of Bethuel, your mother's father. And from there, take to yourself a wife from the daughters of Laban, your mother's brother. May God Almighty bless you and make you fruitful and multiply you, that you may become a company of peoples. May he also give you the blessing of Abraham to you and to your descendants with you, that you may possess the land of your sojournings, which God gave to Abraham. Then Isaac sent Jacob away. And he went to Padan Aram to Laban, son of Bethuel the Aramean, the brother of Rebekah, the mother of Jacob and Esau. So a number of things that we would note in this first paragraph tonight. And what I noticed in this passage, and really what I find surprising, is that although Isaac was initially upset that Jacob had deceived him into receiving uh, the greater blessing, now Isaac calls Jacob in for even more of a blessing. And so maybe the past is the past. Maybe he just sees what's going on. Maybe Rebecca had a chance to calm him down a little bit. Maybe God communicated to Isaac in some way. Or maybe just Isaac, uh, having a moment to think through this more carefully, calmed him down a little bit, allowed him to think more rationally. But whatever led to this change, notice Isaac does seem to have a change of heart. So Jacob is his son, after all. Uh, he's not his favorite son, but he is his son. And so he gets to it here. And Isaac's first concern is that Jacob not take a wife from among the local women. And I know we've talked about this before. The locals were incredibly immoral. We see that with uh, Sodom and Gomorrah and all of the immorality in those cities. 
And so the local Canaanites, in addition to this, they worship a number of pagan deities. And so Isaac then wants his son Jacob, don't marry from here, but go back uh, to your mother's family and go get a wife from back there. And it seems, based on what we've seen earlier in Genesis, that the reason is the people back home are more in line with the morality of Abraham and his people. They are not like the people around here. So Isaac starts with this warning, don't get a wife from here, but go back toward where we came from, find one from there. And then he encur- uh, continues on with the encouragement to get a wife from, from there. He concludes by repeating God's promises to um, Abraham and kind of repeats those and put those now, puts those now on Jacob. So the blessing is now passed down. And we would note it's passed down not through Esau, the firstborn, but the blessing of Abraham is passed down now through Jacob, the second to be born. God will bless Jacob with many descendants, and these descendants will be given the land that was first promised to Abraham. Well, in verse 5, Isaac sends Jacob away, and he heads out toward Laban, who is the son of his brother's mother. And so if I understand this correctly, um, he's basically sending his son to get a wife from among his cousins, kind of remote family, we might say, and they've been separated for many years. But again, as I've said before, anything beyond parents and siblings uh, gets pretty complicated in my mind in a hurry, uh, at least for me. Uh, But I think the point is Laban is part of the extended family, And Isaac sends Jacob off in that direction to go find a wife. So if you're going to leave so you don't get killed by your brother, at least make this a worthwhile journey and uh, go get a wife while you're there. Um, So again, at first he's fleeing at the suggestion of his mother, but now he's sent away by his father and also with the blessing of his father. So before we get to him actually leaving, I guess we should note what he's leaving behind. Um, he's leaving behind an elderly father, and he's not his father's favorite, so he got some conflict there. He's leaving behind a scheming mother, and he is his mother's favorite, but all kinds of complications brought into the family because of her favoritism of him. And then he's also leaving a brother who has vowed to kill him. <laughs> so he's he's leaving these things behind, and in a sense, I think we might say that uh, Jacob is ready to get a new start. He's kind of ready to press the reset button and uh, go far away for a little while to save his life, but also just to kind of have a a little bit of a different life. And he's trying to go out and uh, launch on his own again. So let's continue tonight with Genesis chapter 28, verses 6 through 9, the next paragraph. Genesis 28, verses 6 through 9. Now Esau saw that Isaac had blessed Jacob and sent him away to Padan Aram up to take himself a wife from there. And that when he blessed him, he charged him, saying, You shall not take a wife from the daughters of Canaan. And that Jacob had obeyed his father and his mother and had gone to Padan Aram. So Esau saw that the daughters of Canaan displeased his father Isaac. And Isaac went to Ishmael and married, besides the wives that he had, Mahalath, the daughter of Ishmael, Abraham's son, the sister of Nebaioth. Well, several weeks ago, I said that if you'd like to read about some dysfunctional families, read the book of Genesis. <laughs> And here we have it again, right? This is one messed up paragraph. So Esau, here's what just happened in the previous paragraph, that his dad blessed his brother again and sent him away to get a wife from among their own people. He sees that Jacob obeys this instruction, that Jacob is agreeable to that, that it seems like he's heading toward obedience to this uh, this blessing. And so it seems to me almost that as soon as Esau notices that marrying the locals displeases his parents, He goes out and marries another local woman. He's already married two, if I remember this correctly. And here, I think it's a daughter of Ishmael, so it's kind of in the family, but it's not from the side of the family that's blessed with the promise. So I don't know if he's trying to make some attempt to win his father back or if this is just outright defiance. I'm not really sure if it's to irritate his parents or if this is some small attempt at making things right. I don't don't really know. Uh, I would kind of lean toward the fact that he's being rebellious. If not, maybe he's got a decent heart, but he does the best that he can and fails uh, to really obey what uh, what Jacob was told. So I'm not really sure if that's kind of a good or a bad thing, but obviously uh, he does not go far enough. He doesn't really listen to the instruction that was given to his brother. Of course, it wasn't given to him, but I'm just saying that his parents were obviously uh, concerned for any of their children to marry anybody from that uh, local area. So let's continue tonight with Genesis 28, verses 10 through 17. Genesis 28, verses 10 through 17. Then Jacob departed from Beersheba and went toward Haran. He came to a certain place and spent the night there because the sun had set. And he took one of the stones of the place and put it under his head and lay down in that place. 
He had a dream, and behold, a ladder was set on the earth with its top reaching to heaven. And behold, the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord, the God of your father Abraham and the God of Isaac, the land on which you lie, I will give it to you and to your descendants. Your descendants will also be like the dust of the earth, and you will spread out to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south. And in you and in all in your descendants shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Behold, I am with you and will keep you wherever you go and will bring you back to this land, for I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. Then Jacob awoke from his sleep and said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I did not know it. He was afraid and said, How awesome is this place! This is none other than the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. So now we pick up with Jacob along the way. He's left. He's traveling from Beersheba in the south. He's traveling toward Haran, that area where Laban is living. I uh, didn't look this up again. I think it's around 300 miles. I read it in several commentaries over the last day or so. So I'd say 300 miles, give or take. Um, but partway there, maybe 50, maybe 60 miles into this journey, he spends the night. He has to stop. So we don't know if it's the first night or maybe just along the way somewhere. I know that's safe to say. And and the sun is already set, but he either doesn't have a tent or he just decides not to set it up. He's just in a hurry passing through. Whatever the case is, he uses a stone for a pillow. Um, and to me, I think I might just skip the pillow if the, <laughs> if the pillow was a stone. Uh, I appreciate having a pillow, but I don't have to have one so badly that I'll use a stone. I think I would just rather do without uh, but anyway, he uh, uses this pillow as uh, uh, this stone as a pillow, and he sleeps. So <laughs> apparently something's working here for him. He's got his head propped up a little bit, and he dreams. And of course, usually when we dream, it means that we must be sleeping pretty well. So that's a good sign. He's tired. He's been traveling. Uh, he's pretty much on the run from his brother. He's just been through this emotionally challenging event over the past several days, weeks, maybe even months here. And so he pretty much, once he gets out of town a night or two, he just plops down in the middle of nowhere and he just goes to sleep. Uh, sometimes we refer to this, I think, as cowboy camping, uh, not using a tent, but just sleeping out there under the star. So he's kind of on the run. He's in a hurry. It's just him. So no family to take care of, nobody else to think about. So he just stops at a good place and uh, goes to sleep there. And as he sleeps, he, he has this dream. Uh, we might even describe this as a vision. And in this dream or in this vision, he sees this ladder reaching to heaven. Uh, some of the footnotes there, you may have other translations that refer to a staircase. I think the, the Hebrew word could go several ways, like a ramp, a staircase, a ladder, <laughs> some kind of ascending device. I'm not sure how we would uh, translate that into English, but uh, multiple ways we have of getting from one level to another. So the staircase, a ladder, a ramp, something like that. And this ladder goes into heaven. And there are angels ascending and descending to heaven on this ladder or on this staircase. Uh, but in addition to the angels, notice he also sees the Lord standing above it. And the Lord repeats and reaffirms this promise that he first made to his grandfather Abraham, that he would give the land to his descendants, that his descendants would multiply, and that through his descendants all the families of the earth would be blessed. And beyond this, God promises to protect Jacob wherever he goes. I'll be with you. And he would eventually bring him back to this land. And that's it. I mean, a pretty simple dream, pretty simple message, but it has a huge impact on Jacob. And I hope we notice this over the next several chapters that uh, Jacob goes from kind of some scheming of his own, very immature spiritually, and he starts to learn some things along the way. And this is one of the first steps in this learning experience. I guess we learn a lot from the painful things that we go through. We're better able to comfort others as they go through challenges, as they go through similar family situations. So maybe this is part of it. Maybe all of this has been part of it. But God is certainly uh, molding this man uh, into the father of a great nation, giving him some wisdom, not, not just miraculous wisdom, but he's giving him some wisdom based on experience. And I think that's something uh, that God certainly has the ability to continue to do with us today. I mean, after all, the book of James says, if anybody lacks wisdom, I'll let him ask of God. And in some way, God will, of course, answer those prayers. So anyway, I'm just saying that Jacob is uh, is taking this as a maturing experience. Um, on my resume, by the way, I remember there's a little section for 
maturing experiences and accomplishments. So I think that's one way of, pu of putting it. As we uh, grow in life, we learn things. Uh, not necessarily from education, but we learn things the hard way sometimes. And those are some of the most important lessons that we learn. Well, in verse 16, it almost seems as if Jacob is somewhat uh, surprised, <laughs> shocked. You know, his first reaction is, surely the Lord is in this place and I did not know it. So this is a new occurrence. This is something that surprised him. Uh, this was eye-opening in a sense. It almost seems as if Jacob might have assumed that God was something of a regional God, uh, kind of like Baal. Uh, you know, there is a God here, there is a God over there, and there's a God up here, and this nation has its own God. Maybe he was starting to think like the locals there in Canaan. And he travels, though. So he goes north, like I said, 50, 60 miles maybe, and the God that he knew from back in Beersheba is also, lo and behold, way up here in the middle of nowhere. And he seems to be sincerely shocked by this. This is an amazing thing. Uh, this God we knew way back home is also way up here. And that is just amazing to him. So he learns that God is everywhere. And that's another maturing experience for this man. And the other reaction Jacob has is fear. He's terrified. He's afraid. And he says, how awesome is this place? And I didn't look up this use of the word awesome. I know as we usually translate it, the word awesome it comes from a word that means fearful or terrible, terrifying. Absolutely terrifying. So this is a place where God has spoken to him. And so he refers to it as the house of God and as the gate of heaven. Well, let's continue tonight with Genesis 28, verses 18 through 22. Genesis 28, 18 through 22. So Jacob rose early in the morning and took the stone that he had put under his head and set it up as a pillar and poured oil on its top. He called the name of that place Bethel, however, previously the name of the city had been Luz. Then Jacob made a vow saying, If God will be with me and will keep me on this journey that I take and will give me food to eat and garments to wear and I return to my father's house in safety, then the Lord will be my God. This stone which I have set up as a pillar will be God's house. And of all that you give me, I will surely give a tenth to you. Well, after this vision, Jacob gets up early in the morning. I like that. Getting up early is uh, often good. Uh, not everybody agrees with that, but uh, Jacob saw the value in getting up early. He uses this pillow stone to set up a pillar, and it's almost like an altar in that he pours oil out on top of it. So there is uh, certainly an act of worship in this behavior, what he's doing here. Uh, a cairn, we might say, a pile of rocks. You know, um, they were not allowed to carve rocks later on in the Law of Moses, but they were allowed to stack rocks. And that seems to be what he does here. He renames the name of that place Bethel, meaning house of God. And Jacob concludes this act of worship by making a vow to God. Basically, if God will take care of me, if God will give me food and clothing, if he brings me back here safely after all of this, then the Lord will be my God. Number of ways we could take that. I don't know about you. I'm not overly impressed with this. Uh, maybe we should be, but I guess I'm just a little bit suspicious when people say, you know, God, if you get me out of this situation, then I'll obey you. Then I'll do whatever. I mean, in my mind, we need to be serving God regardless of whether he acts or gets us through some situation safely. I'm kind of thinking of the whole thing with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the book of Daniel. I'm just paraphrasing here, but you may remember when they were threatened with the furnace, they realized that God might save them. But remember their response? They said basically, even if he does not, uh, they would still not bow down to Nebuchadnezzar's statue. I mean, that's the ideal. We'll follow God no matter what. But uh, we, we have the information that Jacob doesn't have at this point. You know, he didn't know about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. That wouldn't happen for hundreds more years. So I'm just thinking, maybe considering his own messed up family situation, uh, maybe this isn't too bad for this man. I mean, maybe it's a step in the right direction. At least we could say he is communicating with God here. So there is something positive that we can say about it. Uh, some of the commentaries were pointing out that the, the construction of the Hebrew grammar uh, doesn't make it seem as much of like he's offering God a deal. But it's like, since you will take care of me you will be my God. Maybe another way of reading that grammatically. So it'd be hard to nail it down here. I'm just pointing out these are some of the possibilities. But at the end, Jacob promises to give a tenth of his wealth to God. And I believe this may be the second reference. It's at least the second reference to the tithe or 10% in the book of Genesis. Remember what the first one was? 
That goes back to when Abraham gave a tenth to Melchizedek, the king and the priest of Salem. So here we have that again. And it's kind of an interesting reference. It wasn't commanded. It was a free will offering from Abraham to Melchizedek. It was not something God demanded that he do, as far as we know. And the same here. Uh, maybe he'd, of course, he'd heard the story uh, from his grandfather, or at least passed down through the, uh, through the family of what happened with Melchizedek. But whatever the case is, uh, he decides or vows, we might say, to give 10% of everything that God blesses him with back to God, in a sense. Well, before we close, I want to share some artwork as well as a reference to this um, event over in the New Testament. And we'll start with the sculpture entitled Jacob's Dream. And this is located on the campus of Abilene Christian University. The artist is Jack Maxwell. He is an art and design professor down there, at least a number of years back. I think this was dedicated maybe in 2006, which might have been the... Uh, centennial anniversary for Abilene Christian, but the sculpture consists, consists of four eight-foot-tall angels. I don't know what they're made out. It looks like bronze, copper, I'm not sure, but they are ascending a ladder, and I don't know if you can tell from this picture, but what's pretty cool is that the ladder has no visible means of support. If you look at it very carefully, you'll see uh, that there are no side rails on this ladder. Uh, there are only the horizontal rungs. So it's kind of a neat way that this statue is designed. And uh, these are the angels ascending and descending on the ladder. By the way, I should point out one of the commentaries was saying um, that this was not just an angel parade, but it was almost as if he was able to you know, open his eyes spiritually and see these angels coming from heaven and back to earth and, and back and forth running missions for God. So they weren't just kind of parading for Jacob's benefit, but his eyes are open and he's able to see what's happening behind the scenes. And of course, we know from Hebrews that uh, angels are sent out as ministering spirits to serve those who are chosen by God. And um, anyway, uh, there are no side rails, so I just want us to not miss that. And uh, they've installed a baptismal pool at the bottom of this sculpture for people to be baptized there. So kind of a lot of artwork on uh, on this subject of course as you can imagine uh, very little of it can we actually share but uh, this is a picture of a sculpture uh, that we are allowed to share uh, the new testament reference comes as jesus calls nathaniel to be an apostle and this is over in john chapter one the last few verses of john chapter one this is john one verses 47 through 51 john 1 47 through 51 Jesus saw Nathanael coming to him and said of him, Behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael said to him, How do you know me? Jesus answered and said to him, Before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Nathanael answered him, Rabbi, you are the Son of God, you are the King of Israel. Jesus answered and said to him, Because I said to you that I saw you under the fig tree, do you believe? You will see greater things than these. And he said to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, you will see the heavens opened and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. As I see it then, what happens with Jacob, it is really a preview of Jesus as the ladder between heaven and earth. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And this passage in John really made me look a little more carefully again back at the passage in Genesis. In John, Jesus says that the heavens will be opened and then these things will happen. In other words, the ladder between heaven and earth originates in heaven and is extended to the earth, not the other way around. The ladder didn't start on the earth and make its way up to heaven. It starts in heaven. Remember the Tower of Babel was a tower that originated on the earth with the goal of reaching heaven. But how did that turn out? Not well. But this is a ladder that originates in heaven with the heavens being open. And I think looking back at Genesis, this is confirmed in Genesis 27, 12, where we just read that a ladder was set on the earth with its top reaching to heaven. So in other words, Jacob didn't build this ladder from earth reaching to heaven, but a ladder was set on the earth. In other words, God is the one who opens the door. God is the one who builds this stairway to heaven. So I just didn't want us to uh, to miss that. 
Well, this brings us to the end of Genesis 28. In terms of practical application, what does this really mean for us? It seems that we have the reminder that God truly is everywhere, even when we're far away from home. And I know many of us here in Madison are far away from home right now, in a sense. Uh, Some of you have come from far off places to be here, from other countries, other parts of the United States. Your families, your physical families are many hundreds of miles away. But I would just emphasize God is here in Madison, just as he was in Bethel, just as he was down in Beersheba, just as he was up in Padan Aram and everywhere. God truly is everywhere. And this is true when we travel. Not only is God with us, he is already at the place where we are going. He's there waiting for us. He's everywhere. And I would take this as a very comforting reminder from Jacob's experience in Bethel. I mean, the terrifying side of that is we can't get away from God. Jonah experienced that. Others in scripture experienced that. Uh, But the comforting part certainly is that if we're in a right relationship with God, Uh, He truly is everywhere, and we can serve him no matter where we are. Well, next week, we hope to come back together to look at chapter 29 as uh, Jacob meets his future wives, (laughs) one at a time, seven years apart, and uh, he gets a taste of his own medicine as he's on the receiving end of some deception this time. So he's not dishing it out. Uh, He's being deceived this next time. And so with that, thank you for joining us tonight. I hope to see you this coming Lord's Day at 930. We're still very early in that study of Ephesians, so this would be a great time to jump in. Just read the book of Ephesians and you'll be ready for class on Sunday. And then after class, we plan on coming together at 1030 for our worship assembly. Uh, Let's close by going to God in prayer. Our Father in heaven, you truly are a God who is everywhere, the God of all the earth. Wherever we travel, on land and sea or even in the air, you are already there. You know us, you guide us, and tonight we pray for courage as we follow your lead. Thank you, Father, for your living and active word, sharper than a two-edged sword. We're thankful for the guidance that your word provides, and we're also in awe of its power to convict us of sin. Thank you, Father, for the promises of Jesus. We come to you in his name. Amen.